God has given us many wonderful gifts, including our material possessions. For the children of Israel, it was a land flowing with milk and honey. It involved great and splendid cities and houses full of all good things. They obtained hewn cisterns and vineyards and olive trees, and they were able to eat until they were satisfied. But then God warned, Watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Unfortunately, the children of Israel forgot this warning. In fact, they eventually said in their hearts, My power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. In the New Testament, when Paul outlined qualities of maturity, he also became very specific in terms of how we are to relate to our material possessions. We're to be free from the love of money. And later in the same letter to Timothy, Paul elaborated on this characteristic. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, before you read this chapter, let's be clear. Paul was not talking about money per se. Rather, he was talking about the love of money. And there's a big difference. In most cultures of the world, we need money to live, to meet our physical needs, to care for our families. God knows that. And he wants to meet our needs. And he wants us to enjoy his good gifts. If this is true, and we know it is, What then does God mean when he says we should not love money? Well, Paul answered this question in part in his maturity profile in both 1 Timothy and Titus. We're not to accumulate money dishonestly. We're not to be involved in sordid gain, as we read in some translations. Paul elaborated on this point in his letter to the Ephesians. He who steals must steal no longer, but Rather, he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. This, of course, has implications for all of us. Specifically, we're never to steal from the government. That is, as Paul exhorted us in Romans, we're to pay taxes to those to whom taxes are due. Now, in our culture, there are ways to cheat the government. Most of us know that. For example, as a pastor... I've been asked many times to perform weddings and to conduct funerals. Normally, I'm given an honorarium, a gift of money for these services, and most times, the gifts are in cash. How easy it would be to not report this income in my tax returns. Who would know? And yet, the IRS rules are very specific. I'm to pay taxes on this income, and not to do so would be to steal from the government. It would be dishonest and a violation of the will of God. But going beyond these very specific, clear admonitions of Scripture, when are we violating God's will with the use of our material possessions? Before you read this chapter, I'd like to give you some quotations from myself. In fact, as I was reviewing what I wrote in preparation for this video message, Here are some of my statements that jumped off the page. I want to share them with you, just to give you something to think about as you read. Here's the first one from page 185. Statistics demonstrate that most Christians in America do not have God's work in their budgets. They include everything else, their houses, cars, clothing, food, and entertainment allowance, but not God himself. As you think about your own experience, your friends, your parents, your fellow Christians, do you think this is a fair conclusion? In fact, do you have God in your budget? Simply stated, is the Lord's work first in the way you plan to use your money? Well, here's another statement on the same page. If Christians plan their expenditures so they never left God out of the picture, in the good times and in the rough times, God's work would never suffer. As it is, God often gets what is left over, if anything. As I reviewed this statement, it really got my attention, even though I wrote it. 
Do you agree with my conclusion? Well, here's another statement on page 186 that's even more pointed. Most people who claim to be Christ followers are not generous as a whole. We've become materialists, which is a direct violation of the will of God. I admit that's a pretty strong statement. Maybe I should say many people rather than most people. What do you think? As you review this statement in this chapter, what are your thoughts? Let me give you one more statement. When we look at the giving patterns of Christians at large, we can only conclude one thing. We have become lovers of money. We practice what our worldly counterparts do. <laughs> well, that may be my strongest statement. And of course, to evaluate that statement, you'll need to look carefully at the giving patterns of Christians at large. You'll have that opportunity as you read this chapter. Thanks for joining me as we study this chapter entitled, Learning Generosity. <laughs>